Originally, I was going to be talking about uh, Cartier-Mew and uh, the Cryptipusil at Malia and the evidence for movement through space and question of privacy and group dynamics. But I, I was seduced by something that happened last summer, uh, namely that uh, some geologists came to look at the site. And we went down and, and uh, in the process, and before I had looked carefully at some of these walkways, uh, which had been mentioned here a couple times, uh, at Malia and elsewhere, and I thought that we had found one. But then I looked at it this summer and I said, no, not at all. This is something different. And so it's a, 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 a sort of a bit of spice, perhaps, for the uh, get-together today. And it introduces a new variable uh, in our equation and introduces the idea of the major, a major harbor site, or harbor sites in general, which Como certainly was. And this is uh, called the middle my known slipway for ships into Comos Harbor and Crete. And I'd appreciate any comments that you might have uh, afterwards. And I'd like to thank a few people to begin with for help in the process. Uh, Maria Shaw sitting here, Alexander Shaw was over there. Uh, our son, Juliana Bianco, who helped to uh, illustrate uh, this. And uh, people who gave really valuable advice, uh, Chimal Pulak, a, a, a Turkish uh, archaeologist, and George Pulos, who is here also, uh, who is an engineer and provided in, in, invaluable uh, information to help the process along. In 1985, at Comus in southern Crete, we revealed a long, narrow strip of slab paving, which you see here on the screen, uh, dating to a middle Minoan period. Here we look, at, we look at it in the foreground. Now, there's an archaic building in the background. And it's, we're looking north, west. And here we're looking northeast at the pavement, which is, use this one here, right there. It was found below the central courts of superposed buildings AA, Middle Minoan Three Building T, and Late Minoan Building P, which you see here in the restoration. The, most, the more important one for our, from our concerns is looking at here. Here is P, this is N. T later on took, or earlier, it took on this whole area, and right there, is the slipway that I'm talking about underneath the courts. At that time, we thought that the pavement was likely a walkway for processions such as those found recently, especially in MM palatial west courts in Crete. Here's one in Malia going from the northwestern corner of the palace uh, to the Crete de Pocil in, in the background. The walkway sometimes linked building groups. At the time of its discovery at Comos, the walkway, so-called walkway, actually seemed an appropriate part of what was to become a palatial site marked by the Minoan elite architectural style. However, now, some years later and after further consideration, this identification must be questioned. While most often MM in origin, walkways can be common at any Minoan palatial site of middle Minoan origin. But only one such pavement is known in Comos. Also, walkways occur most often on flat expanses, <coughs> such as the west courts of palaces, of which you see an example here on the screen. That at Comos stretches in a straight line toward the water edge with a specific and constant slope to and from the water. Here is the outline of building AA, uh, middle Minoan, and here is the central court, and here is the slipway, so-called slipway, going east-west and pointing toward the sea, which is over here on the left. Such a path might even be more useful for sliding ships to and from the water. 
but more important, in the case of the example at Comos, and as seen in our illustration, is that there are shallow gaps about 20 centimeters wide built into the slab pavement every 2.40 meters on center. Seven such gaps are preserved, and you can see them numbered <coughs> along the bottom here. Here's the, here's the slipway. You can see the gaps one after another, and one wonders about those. Moreover, outside of Comos and Crete, the only walkway with gaps is here at Festus in the West Court at these asterisks. They're very narrow. There are three. And the, but they're so narrow that they probably are simply drains if they actually had a purpose. Further to the immediate context of the pavement, which we see a section here, on the east it begins just west and in front of gallery three and building P, which I pointed out before at the asterisk. Then it runs down a slight slope of four and a half uh, degrees, some 18.40 meters long, where its poorly preserved slabs are partly covered by archaic building Q. The latter is a series of inter interconnected storerooms. The Black Sea pebble surfaces of the courts of buildings T and P were laid directly over the pavement in question, which was set on clay bedrock. Above the pavement, the fill was a mixture of earth and pebbles, along with my known and Greek sherds, probably moved around by the rain that had drained down the slope there leading to the sea. It is likely that originally the pavement extended further, both eastward and westward, but was destroyed by the building of T and P to the east and by the sea waves on the west, where we see it in the section here. Here is the slipway, there is the path to the sea. There, there is where the larger buildings were constructed at a later period. We cannot estimate its original length to the west, although it could have run more than 60 meters to the point where we think the ancient water line was during the Minoan period. Set upon the court's surface was a late hearth, perhaps Hellenistic. right there. At two points along the pavement's northern border uh, that you see here, uh, uh, there was a small amount of white plaster, one fragment backed on the north by a small uh, slab set in line alongside it, as if a, a light structure might have once been set there. The date and architectural associations of the pavement remain fairly clear. For instance, just south of it, Toward the east, was found a portion of a floor, possibly of middle Minoan 1B date or earlier. On the east, the pavement would have been about 10 centimeters below middle Minoan, 2, middle Minoan 2AA's court, and because of the pavement slope, about 70 meters below the same court's westward extension. The pavement is also at an angle to all nearby buildings, suggesting the independence of its construction. Concerning the pavement's use, we can first imagine that it began close to where the winter waves now break and continued as much as 50 meters inland. The regular north-south gaps and the width, a meter 40, of the pavement are its most unusual characteristics. Were they drains? If so, why are there so many? And why don't they continue further south? Indeed, it seems more likely that round or plain timbers were set into the gaps with their tops projecting up perhaps five to 10 centimeters. Could the entire pavement have served as a slipway? Up to this point, few prehistoric Eastern Mediterranean harbor sites, such as that at Comos, have been investigated with care. This is partly due to a rise in relative sea level that has submerged many shorelines with the waves causing much damage. Comos, however, was only partly affected by the rise of a meter and a half or more of the relative sea level, which destroyed the western parts of the Minoan, as well as some Greek structures there. 
Regarding the later Greek and Roman periods, fortunately, a most detailed and useful book, Shipsheds of the Ancient Mediterranean, by David Blackman, Boris Ronkoff, and others, was published in 2013. We learned there that during the early Greek period, rival city-states fortified their shorelines and adjusted their city's perimeters. They also built long sheds along the shores with the end of those buildings facing the sea. The ships, usually of military nature, were then pulled into those buildings, which were equipped with ramps on their interiors. On the basis of the remains noted in the new book published, we can briefly compare here the Greek versus what little we know of prehistoric techniques of constructing and using such buildings. For instance, early in the Greek period, harbor size along an open coastline, such as Phaleron at Athens or Comos in Crete, began to be abandoned in favor of closed harbors with peninsulas along either side that could be closed off by building protecting moles and sometimes by connecting the ends of the moles with chains. Thus, both the towns and the ship sheds built along the shore could be protected from enemy incursions. From Phaleron, the Athenian harbor was transferred west to Rocky Piraeus, with its multiple naturally enclosed harbors, which afterwards were furnished with ship sheds along the shore. In an analogous manner, the Comos town was transferred south, southwards to Matala, where a ship shed was set along the latter's southern promontory, probably during Roman times. Between the prehistoric and Greek periods, there was also a substantive architectural and topographic change, to judge from the two well-known examples. The reference here is to Comos, and only recently to the ship sheds that you see here at Katsamba, not far from Knossos, and right on the sea. The harbor town or opinion of Minoan Knossos. At both Comos and Katsamba, the ship sheds, each, with each a building of a number of galleries along the sea and with level floors, were set at least 60 meters from the sea. The ships were likely housed there for maintenance and repair to protect them from damage, especially decay caused by fungus, the sun and the rain, and the teredo worm during the winter months. Ships heading from the sea to the sheds would therefore have to be dragged stem first by as many as 140 men during the classical period, and then up the sea slope and into the galleries which were open on the seaward side. The open ends of the galleries were set down on the shoreline. The galleries were built one next to another, probably with corridors between groups, of which you see an example here in the middle, and with interior ramps rising up within so that the tethered ships could be used in a case of an emergency, could be unleashed, manned, and ready for battle. Chapter 7 in this book, written by Boris Rankov, deals with slipping and launching ships. Useful for our purposes here is that it describes slipways up and down which the ships were dragged. He describes there the wooden parts of slipways which were placed beneath the ships and at right angles to their length and upon which they were hauled. They were called phalanges or palangia, which are now referred to as sleepers or traverses. The Greek ships appeared to have been beached on wooden sleepers. To launch a ship in an open air situation without a special slipway near the shoreline, the sleepers had to be laid within an excavated trench for the keel to slide over them and into the water. <coughs> Timber sleepers, 15 by 10 centimeters in, in section at Carthage, were spaced 60 centimeters apart. Rollers could have been used as well for they are simply rounded sleepers and perform exactly the same function, except that they reduce friction by rolling as the ship moves over them. Sleepers and rollers have been found together in an open slipping area in Marseille. To fill out the picture of slipways, but in a modern context, archaeologist Jamal Pulak describes the situation in Bodrum, Turkey. He says, we've done quite a bit of slipping, our ship, and watch, watching how others are done in a traditional way in local Bodrum boatyard, boatyards. There is no paved causeway, of course, since the boatyards prefer a gravelly beach rather than a sandy one. 
so that the sleepers do not sink into the sand when the heavy boats are pulled up on them. Also, nearly all boats are hauled out of the water at these yards on wooden slipways, which consist of long sleepers secured to large timbers on either side, giving the whole contraption the appearance of a great ladder. When necessary, several slipways are placed end to end to extend their length in order to move the boat to any location on the beach. These wooden slipways are also movable so they can be positioned on the beach wherever there is an empty space to haul a boat. Pulak continues, once the boat has been pulled up to the desired location, it is shored up with wooden chocks placed under the keel and its sides braced with wooden supports, and the sledge is then removed. I write all this because if the ancients also hauled their boats the same way, the sledge or cradle is rather wide, although usually a little narrower than the maximum beam of the boat, and will require a wide slipway. The coma slipway seems to have a width of only a meter forty, which might not be wide enough for a boat of about fifteen meters in length. but it is possible that the wooden sleepers could have extended well beyond the edge of the paved slipway on the Comus site. <coughs> I sent an initial report about the pavement to engineer George Poulos of Toronto for him to evaluate whether our pavement could easily be used by ships. He replied, My sketches, and there are two, were intended to investigate the feasibility of using this, the slope pavement you found at Comos as a slipway to be sure the forces were not too large. Marine engineering qualifications notwithstanding, I estimated the gross weights of the boat, also the compressive bearing loads on the sleepers and keel, and verified loads were within the structural capacity of oak that is available in Crete. I assume ships ranging 35 to 75 feet in length and about a 27 to 1 range in terms of weight. The main area of uncertainty was the design of the hull and most particularly the keel, if indeed there were keels in the modern sense. I assumed a, a substantial keel capable of handling the entire weight of the boat, which is essential for a narrow slipway. I concluded that stationary sleepers are a reasonable way of distributing the load so that the forces of the timber do not exceed the compressive strength of the timbers. You can see that from my sketch. This was its primary purpose. Wooden rollers are highly doubtful. Stationary sleepers need to be prevented from moving in keeping with the gaps in the paved ramp. Assuming that the boats of the period had keels capable of handling the entire weight of the boat, I conclude that you have a reasonable hypothesis that the paved ramp you found at Comos was indeed a slipway. In the archaeological record, I note, such outdoor slipways as at, that at Comos are rare. Blackman and Rankoff comment, open air slipways may have been missed in archaeological exploration because they are less easy to identify not having the telltale parallel walls of the ship sheds. On the other hand, the interiors of the slipway sheds, which housed ramps upon which the ships were set, were probably quite analogous in construction technique. For instance, a ramp at Kos was paved with cement, overlaid with earth or sand fill, and was fitted with wooden slippers set at intervals, such as you see here. The analogy there in the setting of parallel sleepers like those at Comos and like the rungs of a ladder at right angles to the length of the slipway is obvious. Finally, and to continue with the Comos pavement, it appears that the Greek setting of wooden slippers at intervals, either in the open air or within the sheds themselves, provides an excellent, even if later, parallel for our sloping Comos pavement which we can now identify with some confidence as a slipway for ships in which the gaps served as sockets for the greased slippers upon which ships would slide. 
The narrowness of the pavement, meter 40, and the lack of substantial contemporary remains nearby seem to confirm that the pavement was in the open air and led some meters from the shoreline eastward to its destination. Perhaps we are dealing with a single ship pulled up on the pavement in the open, then propped, or perhaps with a storage building for a ship raised when middle my known 2B building AA was being constructed. From the point of view of architecture, at least partially devoted to nautical purposes at Comos Harbor, we can now note Middle my known one, the slipway that you see here. Middle my known 2B, building A, found incomplete but possibly connected with storage of imports or goods to be sent abroad. Middle my known 3, building T, thought by some to have housed ship sheds. Building P, one ship shed building with six galleries. Here, here the ship is being brought up on the slipway, thanks to a drawing by Giuliano Bianco. Building P, which we see here, one ship shed building with six galleries, also seagoing anchors recovered, and numerous pottery remains from abroad. The sequencing here for the earlier part of Como's history seems to coincide with recent geological opinion. Fritulakis, Petrek, and Schroeder have, for instance, proposed that the use of the Como shoreline for harbors began toward the end of, of early Minoan, the early Minoan period, due to the blockage of an embayment that once allowed ships to access both Ayatriada and Festus along the north side of the Festus Ridge. Here is the Western Mesera, Comos is here, Ayatriada, here's the, the uh, Eropotamus River coming down, down like this, uh, Festus and Ayatriada right next to it. And the, the idea is that an embayment here uh, allowed ships to come up that, that far, but then when the embayment was, was full uh, with uh, sludge and so on, uh, they moved south to uh, found uh, Comos as a harbor. Early settlement at Comos does coincide with such a scenario. I wonder if Eleftherio Pariu, who will be talking about early Festus here, would agree with that suggestion. In my view, the identification of the paved way at Comos as a slipway is likely, based on its location near the sea and its orientation to it. Also, its unusual composition of slabs, with wooden sleeper beams set parallel to one another, as in a ladder is like those in the later slipways of Greek shipsheds. For a skeptic, however, there is still room for doubt, so we should enumerate a few questions still worth asking. Why, for instance, is the paved way with gaps the only one found in Comos? We should note, however, that if it underlay the two later court buildings of buildings T and P, there may be more involved than we can see now. For instance, the paved way lies midway north-south between the two colonnaded stores of buildings A, A, T, and P, and its position may not be explained simply by chance. We could suggest, for instance, now, without <coughs> proof, that there are more such ways parallel to the one excavated, two to the north and two to the south, uh, three looking south as you see it here. This intriguing possibility must be explored on the site this summer. On another question, why don't we have slipways leading down to the sea from in front of the long and wide parallel galleries, the shipsheds of LM3 Building P? There are no simple answers, but perhaps our slipway type went out of use after MM2A, and loose rollers replaced the sleeper type we have studied here. Time also is an element. In the case of Building P, for instance, when Maria Shaw first identified it in 1985 as a building for housing ships, an expert on classical shipsheds expressed his doubts, for up to then, the shipshed building type was thought to have been restricted to the Greco-Roman period. But in 2010, with the publication of the discovery of two similar buildings at Katsumba by Vasilakis, which we just looked at, 
the expert changed his mind and wrote a retraction. To suggest a possible parallel circumstance, the technique seen in our display at, at our slipway at Comos could be found by careful excavation elsewhere along the Cretan shore itself, at Katsamba, or at Hanya, or Yarapetra, or, or Palekastro, Carl, or, believe it or not, along a Mycenaean, along with a Mycenaean shipshed in the Argolid in the Greek mainland. Gradually, and as David Blackman has pointed out, our understanding of Bronze Age Aegean marine architecture and harbor organization is progressing step by step as we advance in our understanding of their major seaside settlements. Thank you very much. <laughs>